I could hear a lot of people screaming to get them out of their vehicles and others screaming in pain and a lot of noise going on. And then, and then after a, maybe a minute or so, it was just a deadly silence. It just went silent. There was no noise at all. And it was terrifying. I, I remember trying to get out of the vehicle, but I couldn't get out because I was trapped by my leg. My left leg was pinned between, um, well, the gearbox, I should imagine. There was about six firemen on my particular vehicle, maybe more. The first thing they'd done when they come was to cut the door off. Remember, they used a tool called the Jaws of Life. As soon as they lifted me out, it was like lifting a huge burden off. And, you know, I, I knew then I was going to be OK. The rescue of people trapped in motorway disasters is today a fine art. While doctors and paramedics keep the victims alive, firefighters cut them free from the wreckage. Remarkably, firefighters now help save more lives on the roads than they do rescuing people in fires. Yet 40 years ago, it was a different story. They rarely went to road accidents and rescue teams did not exist. Long before the building of motorways back in the 1940s and 50s, the death toll on Britain's roads was rising alarmingly. You were six times as likely to die on the roads then as today. The old A1, the Great North Road from London to Edinburgh, was Britain's busiest road, and yet it wasn't much more than a country lane. It was a notorious killing ground. One of the worst black spots was a fog-blighted stretch near Catterick in North Yorkshire. There were hundreds of crashes here, but no specialist rescue teams to free the injured trapped in the wreckage. It was here that the revolution began, which was to transform the rescue of road accident victims. The undertakers, the undertakers were the people who used to go to road accidents. Long before the police, the police might have been there, but it was the under, undertaker's job to remove bodies, and they did it. Then it come our job to remove bodies. You just didn't have any equipment in the early days. No, you didn't. No. You had a car like we're sitting in today, and five cones and a police accident sign. That was it? That was it. That was all you had. And a little first aid kit in a, in a box. I'll not say it was a blind leading the blind, but everybody tried to do the best. Their best often wasn't good enough, as lorry driver George Walker discovered in 1960. He was on his way south with a load of pylon bars when he swerved off the road to avoid hitting a man and crashed. Trapped in the wreckage of his cab, he had to tell the untrained fireman how to free him without killing him. The pylon bars had come through the back of the cab and had gone into my leg, straight through my leg, and in the back of the wagon, inside of the lorry, the engine, they pushed my leg up against the engine, they were like threw my leg into the back of the engine and the top, top part of the load had come through, hitting me hand and trapping me hand in the steering wheel. And with me pushing me right forward, and they hit me back, the seat come forward, hitting my back and pushing me up against the front of the cab, and pushed me head out through the windscreen, and I went out straight out through the window, and I was, like, fast with the bottom half and the head out through the windscreen and my leg fast with the engine. And the fireman come to, to try and get us out. 
they, they didn't know what to do with it. They hadn't the uh, sort of tools to do with it. You see, they, they have come fully intending to burn the burners out or cutters out, you see, and they wanted to burn through the piling bars. I says, the only way is to leave the load intact and pull it back. And as you say, they decided to do what I suggested to them, and that's how they got us out. Otherwise, I would have still been there, I think. <laughs> We had numerous accidents. I remember when, just below Cleveland Tontine, all we were told was a car on fire. We didn't know there was anybody in there. And when we got there, this man tried to get out. He couldn't get out. And of course, the heat got in and it got into his lungs and just burnt him up. Gone. Finished. He tried to get out and he was scratching at the windows in, in fright and pain. Terrible. We had the equipment that they've got today to break in in them days. I had arguments galore, and I'm telling you truthfully this. I argued on, on behalf of the Fire Brigade's union. And the answer I constantly got was, these people travel through North Yorkshire but they don't pay rates to North Yorkshire. Therefore, in my opinion, the Minister of Transport should provide the rescue equipment. And that was his attitude. And I didn't like it, because it was wrong. The Ministry of Transport never did provide any rescue equipment and throughout the 50s and 60s none of the emergency services would take formal responsibility for rescuing road accident victims either. The politicians did nothing to help and refused to recognise the problem. Instead it was left to family doctors to campaign locally for better road rescue services. The man who started the revolution was Catterick GP, Ken Easton. I was about, I suppose, 200 yards one side of the Great North Road, and the policeman lived 200 yards the other side. And we used to sleep with our windows open. We could hear the crashes on the town bridge. And when they had these collisions, many of the injured would be tossed over the bridge. And so we would be out there very quickly indeed. And uh, at first I used to take the injured into the Catterick Bridge Hotel, but the proprietors didn't like that, they didn't like blood on their carpets and upset their guests. And just opposite, there was the village smithy, and he his smithy would be warm, obviously, his forge. Had to do a lot of uh, immediate care work <laughs> in the smithy. By the mid-60s, it was clear someone would have to improve emergency care, bringing life-saving medicine to the scene and improving on the makeshift methods of freeing trapped victims. A fatal accident in 1965 proved to be the turning point for the emergency services in North Yorkshire. A truck travelling south went into the back of another truck, and the um, it, we couldn't extra we couldn't um, extricate the, the, the lorries one from another. And the terrible thing was that uh, in the lorry, the driver was terribly injured, a fractured chest, fractured scalp, fractured hips. And he was alternately uh, conscious and unconscious because as we tried ineffectively to uh, distang uh, disentangle him from the, the mangled wreckage, um, cables broke, ropes broke, and this um, metal was pushed back on the poor fellow in, uh, trapped in his cab. That's when we asked Ron Exelby to come up from Leeming. He had heavy extrication haulage gear. We had to wait a long time 
He thinks it is best, but it doesn't go very fast. Garage owners by the A1, like Ron Exelby, had to make up for the inadequacies of the fire brigade and the police, regularly turning out to lorry crashes to help free trapped drivers. So I got there with the big wrecker and we moved the front vehicle away and then fastened a heavy vehicle to the back of the vehicle holding the trap man and then threaded a wire through the mangled cab and put it onto my winch and with the doctor and the police watching carefully just eased the winch and stretched the cab away from him so we could get him out. He had a passenger I, mean, I just couldn't get at that passenger. Uh, he only had a, an amputated leg. If we could have got in would have saved his life. But we couldn't get at him to stop that bleeding and he bled to death whilst we were waiting there. Well, it's awful to see someone dying and being so terribly injured and in great pain and not being able to get at them. It affected all of us there. Please still remember it and firemen still remember that we felt so inadequate People died in our, our arms or in front of us. Lots of people. I know for a fact a lot of people died. But it's not, it wasn't our fault. It was the fault of the powers to be, in my opinion. We argued with them for the proper equipment, but we were told in no uncertain times the MOT, that's the Ministry of Transport, in their opinion, were responsible for providing equipment to deal with road traffic accidents. That's it. What could we do? We were all fed up. So um, we, we had uh, a big meeting at Richmond Police Station. The police, the fire, the ambulance, the Member of Parliament. And we said there should be a, a much improved coordination and training and equipping of all the rescue services going through road accidents. But the reply came, in fact, from the government that um, no money would be forthcoming for any of our sort of work. Britain had the finest rescue service in the world with a 999 service, and if we thought we could do better, then we'd have to do it on our own and as a charity, which is what we did. Ken Easton's pioneering road after care scheme was launched in 1967 and is recognised now as the forerunner of modern road rescue services. Local GPs volunteered to go to the accidents and ambulance men and police were better trained in first aid. Crucially, the fire brigade had to learn how to extricate trapped victims much more quickly and safely than before. North Yorkshire's first emergency tender designed for road accidents came into service, but it was a primitive piece of equipment. It was a Bedford chassis with a Perkins engine governed down to 40 mile an hour. And it was a laughing stock of the North Riding of Yorkshire. Talk about cyclists passing in the night. They used to pass us, did cyclists. That's as fast, fast as we went, 40 miles an hour. And it was a disgrace. And I let it be known it was a disgrace. Inevitably, the road traffic aftercare scheme was unsophisticated by modern standards, but it recorded some remarkable successes early on. A car travelling uh, west and there's a car travelling east towards Scotch Corner. Another vehicle came out the crossroads in between them. And there was four people killed in that accident. And the fifth, which we took out of a car, had his scalp completely cut, just above the eye, and his skull was open. And he kept putting his hand in, trying to pull the top of his head. I had to put handcuffs on him to keep him from doing that. The skull was um, sliced through, and 
Dr. Eve Dias from Topcliffe, he got there, he was called, and he describes it, I think, that, uh, well, there was the skull and there was the chap's brain hanging out. And he was able to put the brain back in and tie things up a bit. That man um, made a complete recovery and I think was interviewed by television in the hospital ward shortly, shortly afterwards. It's remarkable. It was the opening of many new motorways which forced the fire brigades to take the initiative. Very different from the remainder of that misnamed highway is this new motorway section. It's part of the plan to bring the A1 up to A1 proportions. The motorways presented new problems. There were no local garages to go to the rescue and access was difficult and dangerous with fast-moving traffic. And when pile-ups did happen, they were catastrophic. The fire service had to retrain and re-equip to meet the new challenges. To the scene of an accident came something new in rescue apparatus. The demonstration presupposes that in an overturned car, a man is trapped, and the only way to get him out is to cut away the roof. From the 1960s, the fire brigade took on the responsibility of extrication and road accidents. By the 1970s, they were acquiring the latest hydraulic and pneumatic equipment brought in from all over the world. It's the Sanger saw, and it cuts through practically anything. And how's that for an instant sunshine roof? Advances were rapid, and by the 1980s, they had from America a specially designed cutter and spreader called the Jaws of Life, which revolutionized extrication. A London farmer became a leading expert in using the new gear, Len Watson. Here was foolproof equipment that would cut through, actually shear through, uh, metal posts on the roofs of vehicles. It would uh, spread open doors, rip metal apart, and this was all in sort of uh, um, units that could be carried on fire trucks. It was a phenomenal development. British firefighters now hold competitions in extrication, challenging teams from all around the world. But when they first used the new cutters and spreaders, there were serious concerns within the brigade hierarchy over the damage firefighters could now cause to vehicles while getting people out. Okay. When we got the power rescue equipment in 1982, and we picked up our first road traffic accident with this equipment, it was quite a nasty smash, and he was well trapped by the legs. And we got there, and we roof flapped, flapped the roof right back, leaving the rear uh, posts in position to flap that back, took the side, folded it down, and uh, we relocated the steering wheel with the spreaders, pulling it all apart, and freed the casualty. The local station whose patch was on was most annoyed about it. We'd gone overboard, we destroyed this car, and uh, a lot of hard words were said. We had to go and have a debrief on it, because it wasn't the way forward. You don't wreck vehicles like this. And I thought, well, hang on, we got it wrong here. <laughs> it's really the casualty that matters. But in the early part of it, there was still this genuine fear that we were ruining or writing off vehicles that weren't written off before. Today, the fire service carries out nearly 10,000 rescues a year on British roads. In 1992, a driver on the M5 crashed into a steel girder that had come off a lorry. His rescue was a textbook operation. Well, we just pulled off the uh, M6 onto the M5. We went round. There's a big uh, sweeping right-hand bend. And uh, I saw what appeared like a door shutting. I just remember slamming the anchors on in the car and uh, mentioning a few uh, oaths. <laughs> the 
when I first opened my eyes, all I could see was the, these big studs on the side of the girder. And I wondered where the hell I was. I thought I'd just woke up. There was smoke, smoke, strong smell of petrol, and uh, my wife was pulling at me, trying to drag me out of the car. <laughs> I was sure I was going to die, so I wrote myself off and said, well, this is it. Um, you know, it was strange. After that, I was just calm, you know. My legs were trapped by uh, my feet, my knees, and my thigh. I had the steering wheel on my thigh, which was very, very painful. First thing they did, they took the doors off the car. And they just used a couple of uh, pneumatic croppers, like big scissors type things, and. Uh, Two snicks and the doors were gone. And I thought, well, I've just had this respray. <laughs> um, then they explained what they were going to do. They said, right, we're going to cut the roof off so that we, we, we can pull you out. Then they covered me with one of the coats so that any flying bits of metal or glass wouldn't hurt me. Next thing you know, this roof's gone and uh, I'm sat there in the sun. The sun was blazing down. So I asked one of them for me uh, sunglasses and he went scratching around in the bottom of the car and uh, found my sunglasses for me and placed them on me. They actually towed the vehicle, my car backwards so they could actually get at me properly. Then they lifted me out over the back of the car. Well, you're going to be there in a few minutes. Stay there. Uh, there's a, I had about six firemen around me, like, you know, treated me like a little baby. <laughs> Straight onto the stretcher. I felt bad afterwards because people either side of me were dead in the other cars, but uh, at the time and for the next few weeks, I was on a high, nothing could burst me bubble. During the last 40 years, over a quarter of a million people have been killed on Britain's roads. Today, all motorists can expect the emergency services to come to the rescue if they're involved in a road accident. But there's still no coordinated government policy to deal with the carnage. The modern version of Dr. Easton's immediate care scheme is still a charity, and doctors still turn out on a voluntary basis. And remarkably, road accident rescue has never become a statutory duty of the fire service. While they save more lives on the roads each year, they are still funded only to fight fires. Coping with aircraft crashes is the subject in next week's rescue at the same time, 9 o'clock. <laughs>